Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking with the great journalist and author Dave Lindorf, whom you can find at thiscantbehappening.net. Lindorf was awarded the 2019 Izzy Award for Outstanding Independent Journalism from the Park Center for Independent Media. His new book, coming out in the fall, will be called Spy for No Country, Ted Hall, The Teenage Atomic Spy Who Saved the World. It is also a film now playing in film festivals. Dave Lindorf, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me on, Dave. So for people who don't know, uh, who is Ted or Theodore Hall, and how did you come to write a, a book and make a film about the guy? It's an amazing story. I mean, Ted Hall was the youngest scientist at the Manhattan Project. He was 18 when he was actually 17 when he was interviewed at Harvard as a physics sophomore or junior. And then he was hired in January of 44 at Los Alamos and wound up working on the plutonium bomb. He, he, he was only a junior. He didn't get his degree until uh, about six months later uh, in absentia for the work he was doing at Los Alamos. And uh, he decided during that year while he was working that Germany was losing the war, wasn't going to make a bomb, which was the the ostensible reason why the U.S. was building one. And he got very upset because there was so much secrecy to keep the Russians from learning about the bomb. Forget the Germans. And and they start, he started hearing, you know, talk about how the, the uh, real target of the bomb and Groves actually said this at a dinner uh, that. Uh, made the rounds of the scientists. This that is the, the general in charge of, at Los Alamos. General Groves, uh, yeah. And and he said, you know, the real target of the bomb is to control the Russians. And, you know, this really upset a lot of scientists and it upset Ted. Uh, and um, But he said uh, that, um, you know, to, for, to him, uh, he didn't know that, that's, that there were other spies uh, in the Manhattan Project. And he thought, you know, that these scientists who were going to Roosevelt and saying, you got to bring the the Russians in, like Bohr, Niels Bohr was saying that to Roosevelt. And he got uh, the FBI sicked on him for that. And uh, Rotblatt quit the uh, um, the program. He was a, a Polish physicist who just quit and later founded the Pugwash Conference and got the Nobel Peace Prize for opposing nuclear weapons. But he, he was the only one who quit. But Ted thought somebody's got to actually take action. And he said, it fell to me to do it. And that meant he had to become a spy. So, and so uh, what did he do? Well, it, it was sort of a Woody Allen-esque kind of uh, search to, <laughs> to volunteer. You know, spies don't advertise where they are uh and and say we're you know seeking to hire uh, atomic spy at Los Alamos. How do you find us? How do you find a Soviet spy when they're spending all their time hiding themselves? And so they uh, he um, got in touch with his roommate from Harvard, who was a guy named Savvy Sachs. Both of them were second generation uh, Russian Jewish immigrants, both living in New York. They didn't know each other in New York, but they knew each other at Harvard. And um, so he got in touch with Savvy and he said, meet me in Manhattan. So they met and they made a plan to try to find a Russian spy. Savvy said, I'll go to the consulate because you can't go. They'll be looking, they'll be watching the consulate 24 seven. And when they see you, your picture is you know, an identifiable image because of all the badges that have pictures that were taken at Los Alamos. And they'll just check you against Los Alamos pictures and say, oh, you know, what's he doing? So he said, I'll go in and, and I'll ask them about, I'll, I'll call ahead and say, I'm coming to ask about information about my Jewish relatives in Russia and whether they survived the German invasion. And, uh, and then I'll, when I get in, I'll tell them why I'm there. So that was the plan. And Ted 
meanwhile, said he would go to Amtorg, which was the Soviet uh, trade office uh, down in the garment district that was doing a land office business selling um, uh, rec liberated goods from the rich and royalty in Russia to raise money for the war effort, and then also buying supplies from the US to fight the Germans. So, um, so he went down there, it also was a nest of spies, I was informed by uh, several experts uh, writing about spies. The Amtrak was used as a cover because it was a lot of uh, people doing business, you know, and they had excuses to be there. Um, so Ted walks in and he goes up on the, the freight elevator in this dingy, you know, warehouse building in the garment district. And um, he sees a guy working at loading boxes and he walks up to him and the guy says, who are you? And he says, uh, I am trying to find someone uh, to talk to about a uh top secret US weapon project. And the guy got really nervous and he said, well, there wouldn't be anybody here who would know anything about that. And then he gives him the name. He says, why don't you just go see this journalist, Russian journalist, he knows everybody in in New York that's Russian and he'll maybe he can help you. And so he gives him this name and actually uh, Savvy Sachs be decided before he would go to the consulate, he would go to the uh, the art kino, which was a Soviet film institute, and see if he could get somebody there. So he goes and he gets to talk to the director, who turns out to have been a spy, but he didn't know it. And he tells him what he's doing. And the guy says, uh, oh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, and he, he says, uh, but you might go to see this Russian journalist. And he gives them the same name. So when they get together, they've both been told the same thing to go see a journalist. And they both thought that yeah, that's that we're failing. But they also thought, well, wait a minute. They both gave us this guy's name. So Ted got in touch with him. He goes to him. He's a former czarist uh, cavalryman who had left. Uh, he had fought with the white Russians and left the country after the Bolsheviks secured their control over the Soviet Union uh, because he had been with the white Russians. But he gradually had become in favor of the Bolshevik government and had become part of the NKVD spy operation. And so they ended up meeting a spy and he talked with Ted and realized he was the real deal because he told him about the bomb. He told him about the names of the scientists who were at the project, many of which he recognized as significant people. And so uh, they hired him and they, they, they had to do it in a hurry because he only had a two week leave, right? So uh, he had to leave in two days. They had no time to code a message to Moscow and say, should we hire these guys? It's kind of funky. They walked in the door, uh, you know, but he seems for real. He's very smart. He knows all about this bomb project. And so they decided in New York on their own initiative without going to Berea and all these leaders of the intelligence operation in Moscow to get permission. They said, okay, we're going to take him on. By then, they couldn't get in touch with Ted, but he, but Kornikov knew he was taking a train back to Los Alamos that day. So he went to the to Penn Station, which at the time was not the stupid, you know, cramped little place it was then. It was an ornate big place like like uh, Grand Central. And he's there with his father and his stepmother saying goodbye to him on the train. And he sees this he sees Kornikov sitting on a bench wait, beckoning to him. So he goes over to him thinking, what the hell is this? You know, and how do I explain, explain this to my parents? So he goes over to him and he says, um, you're in, you know, we're taking, you're, you're going to be spying for us. And, uh, and then he leaves and to go to his parents and get on the train quickly. And as he's heading for the train, Kornikov gets up and salutes him. <laughs> right. Dave, when you say hired, does that imply what it usually implies, financial no, payments? No, he, was, no, he refused any money. 
he he didn't want uh, any compensation. He just wanted, he was asked by Kornikov, why are, why are you choosing to betray your country like this? You know, and he said, he said, I'm not doing it for Russia. I'm doing it because there shouldn't be one country after the war that has the bomb. It, it's a very dangerous thing if the U.S. has the bomb and no one else does because so they it, use it. And that uh, was his motivation. He He was absolutely convinced, and I think he had it completely right, that the U.S. would have used the bomb over and over again to control things, and um, and in my book, I'm I've document how they had plans to do a preventive. They call it a preventive, uh, unprovoked attack on the Soviet Union to uh, basically bomb it into the Stone Age, so it would never get the bomb. Dave Lindorf, it's it's an interesting question, and I think it's important for people today to realize that at that time, the Soviet Union was a U.S. ally, not a U.S. Absolutely. enemy. Absolutely. But I don't think that that erases the, the critical question of, didn't the colleague who quit do the right thing? Was what was needed proliferation, or was it getting the thing under a global authority, or was it actually, in fact, abolishing the things. Uh, one guy quit, nobody went public. Uh, what, well, how, how was this the right thing to do? Well, here's the, there's a couple of things that that's a real, that's the really important question that, um, you know, there were people like Rothblatt, like Niels Bohr, like Einstein, like eventually Oppenheimer, uh, who was considered a communist because he didn't want to build the hydrogen bomb um, and, and argued against it. Uh, the U.S. was committed to this, and and the proof of that is that, uh, and this is something that I, I assure you, no American, average American knows this, but before the bomb had even been successfully tested uh, back in the summer of 45, the U.S. was already working to figure out how to industrialize the production of atomic bombs, particularly the plutonium bomb. They They were building a massive complex for refining U-235 out of uranium to make the uranium bomb. And they were figuring out how to massively produce the, the needed uh, materials to make the plutonium bomb, both, both the plutonium itself and the complicated implosion device it took to explode plutonium, but also polonium, which is a very difficult and hard to get uh, chemical they used as an initiator for the neutron release to set off the plutonium bomb quickly before it would melt on the way of crashing together. So uh, the U.S. wanted to make, you know, these these first bombs like the Nagasaki bomb and the uh, Hiroshima bomb were handmade. They took, they took, you know, weeks or months to make it. And, and then they, they also would uh, become useless the, particularly the plutonium bomb within a hundred days by because of the short half life, so um, they needed to get figure out how to industrialize them, and that 's what they did over the course of the next couple of years. They started making bombs as fast as they could, and by one thousand nine hundred and forty eight they were making a hundred a year and you have to say, why were they building nagasaki sized bombs at a hundred a year and and increasing the pace of building them even more than that? if they thought the Russians wouldn't get a bomb for 10 years. So, uh, and they did have a plan. They had a, a, a definite plan to hit, they even had a, um, they had developed uh, a projection for when they thought the Russians would get the bomb and when they would figure out how to make them quickly, like the US. And this was before they knew about the spies. And they thought uh, that around 1954 would be what they called a day, which would be when they would have enough bombs that the U.S. couldn't assure that an attack would keep them from getting something to a U.S. target, either of, you know, troop concentrations in Europe or maybe in a harbor in the U.S. or something. And so that was their goal was before a day, take out. Russia as an industrial society with with and the plans were things like they had names like pincher broiler scorcher 
uh, you know, really awful things. And they they had planned to target 70 cities, then 100 cities, then 200 cities, then also Beijing and Tianjin and Shanghai and and Hanoi and Pyongyang at once, you know. So, so worse than the Nazis' plans, whom they had well, just absolutely t- together with the Soviets, right? Yeah, so I it was killed. They would have killed tens of millions of Russians uh, in order to prevent them from getting the bomb. And and what happened was Ted basically and Fuchs, uh, Klaus Fuchs, each gave the Russians information about the plutonium bomb, and that allowed the Russians to say, okay. We don't have any uranium. We don't have the facilities to uh, isolate the 235 and make a uranium bomb. So we're going to devote all our financial resources, and there weren't many at that time, to the plutonium bomb. And they got the schematics from Ted uh, for the atomic bomb. So they trusted it because they had two spies from different that didn't know each other, giving them the same weird Baroque design. So they knew it wasn't this information and they went all out to copy it. And the bomb they exploded in August 25th, 1949 was uh, a, a carbon copy of the Nagasaki bomb. When that went off, that put a stop to the plans to attack them in 1950 or 51. We are speaking with Dave Lindorf, whose forthcoming book is called Spy for No Country, Ted Hall, the Teenage Atomic Spy Who Saved the World, uh, and it makes the case that he saved the world. Dave, I was just reading this book by Joshua Frank called Atomic Days, the untold story of the most toxic place in America, which is about Hanford in Washington, where they made all that plutonium. Uh, And I looked up a footnote because I was interested in a particular passage, and it went to an article by this guy named Dave Lindorf uh, about uh, the the dropping of the bombs on Japan being motivated by the desire to threaten the Soviet Union, to send a message to the Soviet Union. And Frank writes in the book that, yeah, that's a cute theory, but it's not really believable because what dropping those bombs did was actually – accelerate the Soviet uh, work on creating their own bomb. But that seems to me to be an argument that because militarism is predictably counterproductive, it doesn't really exist. Uh, And that seems to me just dead wrong. I I mean, we just saw Russia invade Ukraine because it hates NATO when everybody, including Russia, knew it would be the greatest boost to NATO ever. Uh, I mean, these actions are counterproductive, yes, but that doesn't mean they weren't motivated by what they appear to be motivated by. What do you, what do you say? Well, the Russians were going full tilt on their bomb project, unknown to the U.S., uh, by, by uh, February of 1945. When they got the word, when they got all the details about the atomic bomb, which they had by then, Stalin was convinced that they had to get it going, and that the, they were going full tilt. I mean, they the the really fascinating thing about the Russian project, which was done in Kazakhstan mostly, was that they um, they. Completely, you know, there weren't any spy satellites. The U.S. had a pretty poor spy system in the Soviet Union at that in those days, and uh, nothing like what the Soviets had going here. And they didn't know about the project. They didn't know about the spies in the Manhattan Project in 1945. But um, but what the the Soviets managed to do was they announced that they were going to. Uh, have a massive influx of people into Kazakhstan. They were giving away land. They were encouraging people to go there and do farming. I actually know a a young woman who is a pianist here, a student of my wife's uh, for a while from Russia, who said that her father told the story about his grandfather, his father going out there to, uh, to be a a worker farmer. uh, But it was all a trick. It was like a cover up. I mean, they were happy to have them go there and do that, you know, and turn the desert green. But 
the real motivation of shipping everybody out there was to have an excuse to have these trains of people and material, you know, tractors and every bulldozers and everything going to Kazakhstan without the U.S. suspecting something. And what it was was they built a sort of uh, uh, Oak Ridge uh, kind of facility there and a test site in the semi Palatinsk um, to do their own bomb project. And the U.S. didn't have a clue that that was going on. And so why did they drop the bombs on Japan? Well, the reason they, the, the U.S. dropped the bombs on Japan was because they wanted to send a message to the Russians. Truman wanted that message sent that, that uh, this, we're the new, we're the new unipolar power on the block and you're going to do what we say or else. And this bomb destroys cities, right? Instantly, right? They needed a, they, the, um, the, for one thing, they were loading the bomb onto the first bomb, the, the, uh, the uh, uranium bomb for Hiroshima was loaded on uh, from a dock in San Francisco on July 17th, the day after uh, the Trinity test, right? It was loaded onto a ship to be brought to Tinian as fast as possible. And, um, and it had been sh built fast and shipped from uh, from Los Alamos to San Francisco to get on that boat before the test of the plutonium bomb. They never even tested the atomic bomb because it was so simple to make that uh, that wasn't the issue. It was just getting enough U-235 to make it. The plutonium bomb was, they had to test it because they didn't know if it would work. So, and then, you know, shortly after that, it, the, I read in, uh, in um, Al Perovitz's book, that uh, it, it, this magnificent, you know, tome about the, the bomb, dropping of the bomb and the decision for it. And he, he points out that the uh, decision to drop the second bomb was made the day after the Hiroshima bomb was dropped. And the, the plutonium bomb had been flown out in pieces because it was too heavy to fly a plane all the way to Tinian. So it was flown out in pieces and put together at Tinian really quickly. But they wanted to get both bombs. They wanted to do, you know, to test them both in a war setting, make sure they worked, and yeah. send, and show the Russians what the real damage was that they could do. And so when it comes to Ted Hall, why does nobody know about him, uh, even to the extent that we know about uh, the, the Rosenbergs and other uh, alleged spies. That's that's another fascinating part of the story. Is that Ted, um, even though he was an a amateur and he made a lot of mistakes, and his partner Savvy Sachs was kind of a nut job, um, and actually was talking about with people that after the war that he had helped the Russians get the bomb. <laughs> uh, they were not prosecuted. Nobody knew about it. Hoover didn't leak it. And I found out why, because I, I got the uh, FBI file on Ted's brother, and that explains it all. He had an older brother, 11 years older than him, also brilliant, who was an um, aeronautical engineer, went to Caltech, and he ended up being, his name was... Um, was uh, Edward Nathaniel Hall, and he was he he spent in World War II. He joined the army and was stationed in the UK, where he was tasked with put in charge of uh, repairing damaged bombers, be, you know, liberators and B-17s coming back from Europe, damaged and getting them back in the air. And he was brilliant at it. But uh, when he got back from the war as a major, he was in based at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Base where they had a top secret rocket engine lab. And he wound up being in charge of developing rocket motors for ICBMs and IRBMs and invented the Minuteman and the concept of the Minuteman, you know, like instant fire 
uh, solid fuel rockets. And the Air Force needed him as he was their their guy. And they needed him so badly that there was uh, an exchange of letters between Hoover and the head of the Air Force's new Office of Special Investigations, OSI, a guy named Joseph Carroll. His son's a journalist, by the way, Jim Carroll at the uh, Boston Globe. I talked with him about this. Uh, Joseph Carroll was a top aide to Hoover and ended up getting hired with Hoover's uh, glowing endorsement to head the OSI at the Air Force. But he, the, when I got the file, the first thing I found was a letter from Hoover to uh, Carroll, to General Carroll, very polite, you know, dear, dear General Carroll, uh, I'm writing to let you know that, uh, that your major Edward Nathaniel Hall, uh, who's working on a top secret uh, rocket lab at Wright-Patterson Air Base is the older brother of a known Los Alamos atomic spy. And uh, we would like to interview him about his brother. So then the next thing is a letter from March uh, seven, March yeah. 24. A minute and a half, Dave. March 24th, he says, Dear General Carroll, I, I, I gather from your response to my letter that you're going to handle the investigation into Ed Hall, uh, but I haven't heard from you about our being able to interview him, and we urgently want to interview him. He didn't get to see him for another three months, and basically I can't get the mail, the response letters, but um, you know, it's clear that he was shut down. They finally got to interview him with an OSI guy in attendance and only ask about what he knew about his brother, not about himself. And three weeks after that interview in June, uh, Ed was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and later Colonel, which was a real thumb in the eye for Hoover. So obviously, and, the, and they stopped their investigation, the files on Ted and Savvy stop at the end of that year. So he was shut down because they couldn't afford in the McCarthy period to have his the rocket guy's brother arrested as a spy. It would have been the end of his career in the Air Force. <laughs> so one top rocket guy in the U.S. military is protecting a brother who's a Soviet spy. And another one, Ferner von Braun, is a former Nazi user of yeah, slavery. It's, 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 and, and this guy hated Nate, Nate Hale. Uh, hated Werner von Braun. He thought he was an idiot and, you know, a, a, a pain in the ass and was getting in the way of his good work. Well, he sold his idiocy very well uh, and stayed out of prison or any other difficulties. Dave Lindorf, uh, the book is going to be called Spy for No Country, Ted Hall, the Teenage Atomic Spy Who Saved the World. Thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks for your great questions, Dave, and thanks for having me on. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.